And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Jeff Selver, who in December of 1997 experienced the rising, which was an agreement with gray aliens to discover his soul. The rising required him to take a leap of faith, sell all of his possessions, and begin a life of traveling from place to place. What unfolds is a truly epic adventure of removal from society and living close to nature, all while having contact events with gray aliens without his knowing. Jeff, thank you for joining me and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I didn't mention this in the beginning, but you had a prior history of being a professional banker and involved in investment banking. How did That's you correct. how did you make that transition from that to UFOs? <laughs> right. Um that was the career choice at the time and uh it uh it's safe to say it wasn't fully driving with me and um it uh I I guess you could say I was I was restless too and uh this alien contact sat in the background and it was just a little little of a pinprick in the subconscious that something wasn't settled and I had to figure things out. And uh, I thought it was a career choice that I, I was looking for. So I actually ended up uh, leaving the bank and I went to a software company and uh, that still didn't fix the bug that was sitting in the background. And uh, I did have a weird history and uh, and I eventually, uh, around 2016, I started to ask a lot of questions about what had happened to me. So here's the summary is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, I went traveling. Um, and that was, yeah, 1997 to 2000. And it was a weird, strange circumstance that got me traveling. And uh, the only way I can explain it is a consciousness event. Uh, it was extreme and it was traumatic and uh, it traumatized me. But it had me, you know, leaving society and uh, traveling from place to place. And when that happened, I saw objects in the sky kind of like, you know, following me, uh, orbs, uh, different colored orbs. And um, at the time, I didn't quite associate that with alien contact. I didn't know that it could manifest that way. And I didn't, yeah, I just didn't have that knowledge at the time. Then, uh, so I was, by the time 2016 rolled around, I was questioning that period of my life, like what had happened? Why did it really roll out the way it did? And I didn't have any answers. Um, I didn't think about aliens or UFOs at the time. I was, as, as you mentioned, I was a banker. I had an MBA. Um, I was, I worked in the corporate world. I also uh, took my shot at corporate training and uh, was doing mindfulness, going into corporations and teaching them how to, uh, how to, you know, define, you know, uh, basically make their leadership more stronger through meditation and mindfulness and uh, thinking that that was kind of also what would solve that itch. Um, but uh, it's safe to say that uh, the paranormal events of my life were increasing and everything kind of started to climax really, uh, really intensely. And eventually, um, I watched Jeremy Corbell's documentary on Bob Lazar, and it was the first thing that kind of hooked me. I, uh, when I saw that, I actually thought, oh, this is really good. And, and you know, I actually was into UFOs as a kid, uh, watching books and, and, you know, all just the kind of mystery of the unknown kind of books. And his documentary had me questioning what I was into as a kid, if these were real or not. And I actually took it upon myself to, uh, to find something on YouTube. And I actually found a, a kind of an orb and UFO channel that really had people's uh, videos of, of weird anomalous objects in the sky. And what it did was trigger everything that happened to me when I was traveling. And eventually the orbs and things that were following me traveling came back at that time. Kind of like I had opened a door and then they responded. And, uh, and then I got really, once I saw something repeating itself the way it was when I was traveling and I was in that weird state with the, the consciousness stuff, it all kind of triggered, uh, first fear because <laughs> I didn't understand why that would be connected. What was the connection? Why would they come back? Why would they come back at this time when I was researching these UFOs? And, um, and that, that started a snowball, uh, I, it's hard to kind of explain the details. Um, a lot of it is in a book, so I do have a book about it all. And, uh, but it really 
let's just say started opening uh, flashbacks. That's the simplest way of putting that together. Um, I had to confirm something. I actually had a screen memory that I didn't really understand as a screen memory at the time, a screen memory being, you know, a fake memory. Uh, and I had a fake memory as a teenager uh, that came to mind around these orbs and stuff in around in my neighborhood, here in my neighborhood. And I went to the location of that screen memory. And it was the first time ever that um, that I had a distinct feeling of I had one version of events in my memory and I could feel distinctly something else had occurred there that was not known about by myself. It was a very distinct feeling of kind of like two separate realities, one with which I actually occurred and I wasn't aware of. And the other was uh, was what I thought was just a normal teenage uh, event of basically going into the forest. And it turned out I had a contact event uh, without my knowing. And uh, but it, it placed a screen memory there. And once that cracked, um, it, it was about over a couple months, but I was really resisting it because I didn't want to believe I had alien contact. I was convinced it was kind of like the stuff I'd read as a, as a teenager, uh, like Whitley Strieber's kind of like, you know, terrifying, uh, menacing, um, biological. I actually thought I was going to open up something very horrible about my past. And I was actually very terrified of it at first. And uh, resisting it started to create flashbacks. And I had, I had scenes in my head of being that my teenager self, 16, 17, uh, you know, 19 and 20. And I had, I had seen these images of, you know, memories is what they were because they were filled with the emotions of that teenage moments. And, uh, and they were on crafts and, um, and they weren't all that scary. I, some of them were scary, but not everything. And and in fact, some cases I was communicating with the entity that was there. Uh, and that's what had me, you know, go down the road of trying to understand exactly what all this was and why were they actually still here? Why why did they come back? Um, and uh, and why did I feel I needed to understand all this and unravel it? And also how did they affect me? Because they they were the reason I went traveling. And uh yeah, so uh that's that's how that all kind of cracked open. And I went from banker to UFO guy. <laughs> from what you're saying, the way I take it is you had some sort of a spiritually transformative event or, or consciousness event that set you on the road to just take off and travel, right? Yeah. What yeah. was that event or what happened to you? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I recorded it. It's the best thing I ever did for myself was that I recorded that time in my life. So because it's very strange. Um, it's it's safe to say it was God realization. So I had a, prof but here's the thing. I was not a meditator. I was, I was a punk rock kid. I was a musician. I loved my music playing and I was in bands and I was in music school at the time thinking that that was my choice of career. But I was having, um, throughout the year 1997 was a, was a slow progression of uh, kind of psychic, uh, past life awareness, things started to kind of unravel. And they were just natural exploration for me. I I didn't know any of it was related to alien contact. I assumed I was just a teenager reading the right books, going down the right path. And I wasn't even saying to myself, I need to find God or I need to do these, this kind of, you know, have an experience like this. And um, I I read a book that triggered it all. And the book was about abandoning your life for God. And when that happened, it clicked some things inside my own subconscious. And uh, one of the most profound aspects of that moment was my cells feeling like they had light in them. My body felt golden. I recorded these dreams as I was going through it. I'm, I'm, full, I'm filled with golden white light. And the cells in my body felt like they were pure white light. I had this ecstasy and joy uh, that was very actually just so pronounced. It was it was too real for me. It was it, it changed me on the inside basically, and um, and I could feel my spirits controlling my body uh, as I moved my hands and my legs. I could feel the ener energy that was me from another place, this kind of higher self or spirit self. So it was like a forced spirit because I felt like a victim. That's the weird twist of it all. Um, I felt like a victim to this highly spiritual thing going on in my life. Um, I had for the first time awareness of chakras, like I could feel energy culminations, especially at the top. And I wasn't really like even going down these roads of trying to understand these things. 
And the most, uh, so because it was so real, it was paired with this message to lead your life. Um, and I started having synchronicities, like my world would give me messages that were tied to all this to leave me your life. I would, uh, friends would encourage it right at the right moment where I was backing out from these ideas. And, uh, and, uh, and then dreams would actually have kind of links with my, my external world in some way, uh, through synchronicity. So it, basically the bottom line is it was a very extreme moment that was very real. And I listened to it. Now, the, one of the big ones that I hold on to is the body filled with light, which I have now other contactees to talk this way. And I can't find anything like this in Vedic philosophy or any of the scriptures, uh, or even, you know, on the side of this, as I actually uh, studied with a Vedic guru, and there's nothing like this, you know, having your body filled with this kind of like light that you can see it in your mind's eye, and you feel this kind of ecstasy and joy out of it all. There is Kundalini risings, and I do believe that it was something along that line, but uh, it was so pronounced and, and it gave a message to leave my life, like it didn't really all kind of add up. And uh, so it was God realization with some added things that... I were left as mysteries for all my life until this all kind of unraveled. So at some point in your life, you started having all these memories of ET contact bubbling up to the surface. I think it was during meditation, right? Uh, it could be anything. anything. It was, yeah, it was walking. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, basically my subconscious was now trying to push these things out and they were coming out in in all throughout my life as i was doing my job it would be even yeah after you started having these memories return did you still continue to have contact i uh, so the orbs and the things were flying around in my house and i started saying i know it's you and they worked with that so i was able to get telepathy from the crafts and i was able to communicate with them and I have experienced it with other people. So that's really fun. <laughs> um, so I haven't had physical alien contact since uh, the last one uh, was 2017. And there was an actual very specific event that involved my partner. And um, and I didn't know at the time that that was alien contact and left marks on my body, uh, mysterious scratches. And it turned out to be an alien contact event. So that was the last physical contact event. Um, but the orbs kind of replaced it all. Uh, so I was... Um, so I, yeah, it's a form of contact, of course. So I was able to communicate with them and I, I have actually recently within probably the last the, like four weeks ago, uh, I saw them again and there was a communication. Well, what I think is fascinating is that some of my near death experiencers have seen ETs in the afterlife, but you kind of have the opposite. Whereas the grays have shown you the afterlife, right? Yes. What did yes. they show you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. So, okay. So the story goes, I made an agreement with gray aliens to discover my soul. Is this pre-birth? This, uh, or, or during your life at some point? Great question. Before birth, they show me that I made an agreement to work with them. They don't explain that agreement. It's, it's my 16 year old self, my first, con what I call the first contact event, though I had childhood contact events, this was really the beginning of, of the entire thing that would kind of affect the rest of my life was this 16 year old contact event. And, and there they make, it's the agreement. It's an official agreement. They actually wanted my permission. And, uh, and so they, the agreement is, you, uh, you know, to discover my soul is really the best way to frame it. So, uh, like it's an agreement to discover my soul. Will you like? Will you go through this agreement with us? And it was kind of an experiment on their behalf. And they were very interested in sh and and watching how it changed a human being. What they will what they would do to me, and uh, and I agreed. Uh, also because I could feel I was bonded to them. Um, as a sixteen year old, they really explained I had their DNA in, in me, and um, and I didn't really understand those things at the time, but I felt it and I could feel it at the time and have consec have consecutive moments throughout the contact events where I felt very bonded to them. And uh, and it also answered some weird things about my life at the time. So I kind of went with it and agreed for this, to do this experiment. And it was right then and there in that 16-year-old contact event in the at 1993, uh, after a medical procedure, they, they're basically like, come, come to this room. And I go into a uh, a very 
a large white empty space um uh, extremely large for how for the size of the craft so there was an obviously weird dimensional thing going on where they just empty just huge like football field length space going all and out in all directions and um the main alien that i'm dealing with uh steps forward and says what's going to happen is going to be beyond your comprehension uh, my body phases <clears throat> seems they basically start levitating and my body kind of dissolves is the best way to frame it. And, uh, and I, the ethereal energy of my entire, all my, the, yeah, the, the energy that would be left of your body being phased, I guess, is the ghost you. So that got collapsed. They, whatever this room did, it collapsed that. And I experienced, I basically transformed into something else. And, uh, uh, it was a extreme bliss rush, so uh, joy and uh, but childlike elation. But it erased the identity of the sixteen year old self, and I became this purity thing, and uh, and I experienced instant elation with all the entities, and experienced unity with all the entities, and they were no longer aliens anymore, and I was no longer a human anymore. We were this core energy thing, and the and I also could felt this merging with the craft. So this we were. I was in this state of unity with the craft and they began whipping around and, and zooming around. And, uh, and then I started zooming around and, and uh, we could play actually, there was lots of play and there was lots of lights going off. And I was basically just in a, an ecstasy state. Ex just ecstasy is the only way to frame it and joy and ecstasy and child purity from here. Um, I didn't, when I had all these memories, I didn't know all these details. I didn't know crafts were alive. I didn't know that the dimensional aspect of the aliens too. I didn't know that it could go, the, the, these crafts could be bigger on the inside than they were, than, you, than they appear on the outside. I didn't know those details. And uh, these were just the memories I had. And so in this case, the main alien I was dealing with were all energy forms. She turns into a portal and, uh, and she's like, come in. So she's like kind of telepathy or oozing this, these feelings of like, come in, come in. And when I go in, it starts a sequence of events. And all I can assume I'm doing is watching holograms of real life events. So I'm the orb and I'm watching. The first thing I see is a body and it's a dead body. <clears throat> and it's a, a kind of like a black environment. Like everything is all the erroneous information is taken out and there's just this body there. And over top of the body is a sparkling, pure white light energy. And I instantly, I have an instant recognition. I'm a shared experience. That's me. And I can feel it's the past me. It's like 70 years ago. I can feel the, 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 the passage of time and I can, and it's obvious to me what's going on instantaneously. I'm watching the death of my last life. So they're showing me the death of my last life. My my, I just died, and there's the spirit crying about the death, and uh, and I'm stunned. I'm in this whole transform transformative state of being stunned of what I'm watching, and uh, and it starts it's crying and it starts going up and up and up and up like it's kind of just ready to die and or ready to pass on, I guess. And the main alien I'm dealing with, the gray alien, she's kind of like wants me to see she's like watch this and she there's this vibration of her like kind of saying that and this sparkling thing is moving up moving up moving up and then it goes through a some kind of veal some kind of boundary a boundary is the best way to frame it and when it does it transforms into the only thing i can call is my higher self so it transforms into this very completed uh, uh me it's it's not but it's not me it's 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 a portion of me it's my intuitive self is the best way i can frame it my no my no space no time self but here it is fully personified as its own thing and 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 what's so i'm having a shared experience i can feel it transforming and and then it's not concerned for the pain that the last life just had it has no attachment to it at all and it's detached and so I'm having a shared experience, but the the alien seems to overcode it with an image, 
of a the higher self, of my higher self, of a man in a gown with a beard. So it's a white gown and a white and a beard. And and all of a sudden that's my higher self. And I can feel the depth that goes further that this thing is the best way is to, to explain it as dimension. It's a dimensional uh, higher self. And then pretty much from there, that's the next step is there's a gray alien there in the afterlife. And, the, and then there's like, it's obvious what's going on. This alien wants me to see this. And the gray alien is approaching my higher self now. And it's saying there's some kind of uh, communication. So I'm, I'm not getting the nitty gritties. And I'm seeing that they're communicating and there's this, uh, like, will you work with us? Kind of like, will you come with us or work with us? Or will you be, will you do whatever we're doing? We need help. Or there's kind of these vibration of like, work with us. We need help. And, and the premise being, I can only assume is, is we need bodies to manifest on, on planet earth who will, who will be working with us. So it's, so it's kind of like that. So there's like, they're showing me an agreement was made with my higher self. And, um, and in this passage, they show me several things that are that are absolutely fascinating that as I continue to learn about the phenomenon seems very real. And so the next thing I see, like they're showing me clips, slots, like pieces, as if it's like as if these events are photoshopped. They're taken apart. So they're real events, but then the the ones they want me to see are all sliced together. And the next thing I see is my higher self waiting above earth and a group of grays coming up, the like tall grays, actually specifically tall grays. So I'm seeing earth down below as an orb from the version of, from the vantage of my higher self. That's in this ethereally very, I guess it feels a thinner version of space. So it's like thin dimensions of the afterlife exist in space. And they're watching as my, as these gray aliens are coming up and the gray aliens enter the afterlife realm. And there's a communication that is, conveyed to the afterlife dimension or to these entities and it is humans made a choice about something and the vibe here is that we're in the 50s now so the death of my last life was the 30s like late possibly 40s and then now we're in the 50s and something had happened where humans had made a choice that determined how the next decades would go so there was a first off there's a communication with gray aliens and humans and that's kind of what they're alluding to here and it made choices that affected other dimensions and then my higher self was waiting for that moment. Once it knew that moment, it could start building me. So it was like waiting. It's really wild. <clears throat> and uh, and then once that moment occurred, that the choice was made by humans, my higher self started planning the me. There was a, a grid with which my higher self could cho uh, was like choosing bodies to to manifest in. And it was using a grid to do that. And I've found other contactees who've seen grids like this. It's really weird. And especially tied to humans and population. And yeah, it's really strange. And But this grid was tracking gray alien bodies, uh, bodies that have gray alien DNA in them, like family lines, genetic lines. And so my higher self is there using it to to to, to track or to, to create a body that would have a gray alien DNA in it, and uh, which would be me, I guess. Um, the next scene. Uh, this is a lot. <laughs> should we? Should we uh... Well, I'm, I'm hanging on. What I can say is, what you witnessed is what I hear from a lot of near-death experiencers. They're in this place that's white. They're in a place of bliss. It's interesting because to me, it's like you witnessed a death, but from a third-person experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? Separated. Do you think that? ETs or gray aliens are managing the afterlife. And and what I mean by that is because some near-death experiences will see Jesus, some will see angels, some will see relatives. Do you think that the ETs are managing all this and and having people see what they want to see or whatever will make them feel comfortable? Yeah, um, it's a great question, and that is where I'm leaning towards. You got mm -hmm. it. I'm totally leaning towards uh, and the twist being that they're actually not aliens, though they might be, uh, there is some genetics going on here where they definitely are a genome mm -hmm. that is foreign to the foreign to planet Earth. But it could be something really wacky that like, you know, your soul when you're planning to birth in this life and there's a management souls going on to help with that. 
and you, your higher self is not considering them aliens. They're considering them angels or they're the dimension with which to help manage things. Yet when one of those goes down to planet Earth to do something, it's materializing as an alien, as the gray form. Um, I am convinced of that because of the larger picture content they give th to me throughout the contact events. Uh, they made the human body. And the point of the human, of the human form is to uh, birth God into souls. So there is a real um, service role that I'm certain they're doing. They feel they're doing, and uh, and that service role is, is is dimensional and spiritual and involves the big G, involves the big God form, which you know we call God. I'm not really quite quite clear they call it God, but uh, it is definitely the unified field that is aware, and and we are all offshoots of it. Um, so you're you're bang on going in that direction, and I'm I'm convinced that this is kind of the bigger picture is that they're managers. Uh, they also tell me two things: um, they're the stewards of the planet. So there you got a management role, and also humanity's agents of change. So those are when I asked her directly at that 16 year old contact event, she asked, those are her words. I'm trying to figure out who they are, and she says we're humanity's agents of change. So fascinating stuff. Did you ever get any indication from them? Why do we keep coming over and over again and especially experiencing so much suffering? Right. So the suffering element is interesting because, you know, all the spiritual religions, not all, but, you know, like I'm a, I'm a practitioner, a practitioner of Vedic philosophy and, uh, and Buddhism is very similar to that. There is a level of detachment to the, to the human realm, right? Even as you, uh, that is what kind of spirituality is, is trying to embody the higher self. So when you're, even if you're experiencing pain, you're aware that the pain is playing a role in life. And I think that's the level of the higher self, regardless of aliens. And, but I do know the aliens are on the level of the higher self because they show me in that white room. So, and there's something to be said about what contact events do to people. Sometimes people experience an alien contact and they're traumatized and they're terrified. Years later, they realize, you know, that alien was showing me something. And it's, there is a, there is a, there's a fundamental fact. Humans are stuck in a paradigm. Humans are caught in a matrix. Humans believe that the physical world is not the simulation, yet we're kind of getting the facts now that it is, we're getting the facts that the, that the, the, there is an energy outside the body that, you know, there is a spirit, if you will, or an energy form that can, uh, that, you know, doctors catch in near-death experiences and that, you know, past life researchers are catching on to. So then that does have to say something about the higher self and the realm with which we all move to that put that bot, that put that energy there to begin with. And, and I know there's like other theories, but I subscribe fully that, uh, that you come here to experience the separation on purpose. And that would mean that suffering or pain plays a role in, in that, in the creation of self. And, uh, and that our, our role is to, even in our pain and suffering, to find ways to bring the higher self into embodied into the human. And from how I understand that is to worship God, to find ways to uh, bring God into your heart and to uh, make yourself one with the universe, even if you're experiencing suffering and pain. And I uh, and know that that's loaded to say I'm very aware of that, but I think that's what the higher self does. And I see the gray aliens operating on these levels when they interact with humans. I see many contact events that can be transformed into uh, teaching lessons, even though they're harsh or or wild or or you know hard to humans. But so can God be right? Like the higher self can be too, right? People are born into child you know child murderers or child soldiers there's extremes here in the world and or you know a, a meteor can smack into the planet and, and wipe out millions of life forms in one instant so uh life can be hard but there is something to be said about this other realm and its role whether it's great aliens managing it or it's our own higher self right so are you saying in the afterlife realm the gray aliens appear as light beings but when they want to come into our realm, they have to take the form of a gray alien. I'm speculating. So I can't, I can't fully say that. In, in the vision I saw, they were in their corporal form in the afterlife, even wilder. So, but I am speculating that, um, as, you, as you said, the, the kind of management role. So, um, <clears throat> because we are dealing with dimensions here. So 
one thing can look one way to us when we have one set of eyes on or a pair of perception on, and it can look very different to us when we have a different set of perception. On. And uh, and that's what dimension means, right? A dimension is to different different angles, different different measurements. And uh, and so could there be a scenario here where uh, that's kind of more how I'm speculating that as as managers, um, they've been there the entire time managing. And and we don't witness them as as the dark gray alien or that you know big eyes and and heads and we don't see that in the afterlife because they're in a different form when they're interacting with the spirits, uh, but then they're manifesting. They're coming off as these physical, materialized uh, creatures that look very strange to us. Um, I don't know that that they would be transforming themselves in these other dimensions, but I do also do know that they can do that. I have experienced in that. I have experienced that also in the in my eighth contact event. Uh, the definite impression is that this entity can be an angel. It can turn on angel, like, you know, Mother Mary, like a, an, an impression of Mother Mary coming down in an angelic form. Ah, and that entity can do that. So again, speculation about their actual, what they're doing in the afterlife. But uh, I do believe that they could, something like that could be going on. That would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If we want to, do you think we can go somewhere else after this life, like go to another dimension or another planet, or do we have to come back here? I don't actually think you make the choice. I'm not convinced the individual makes the choice. You're not in control of your life. Your higher self is in control of your life. And um, I'm convinced of that. And though, you know, you can you can use your higher self to make choices. I think that's the, that's the key here. Um, but I think the human or, or as we're embodied, you're going to, uh, to feel what you do really want to do. I think our minds are the ones that um, says, no, 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 this is my last life. This last one sucked. I can't wait to get out of here. And you kind of have this very mental perspective of it, but the pain and the suffering we kind of, or the hardship we go through. But the higher self might be saying, no, 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 I like that. <laughs> I like that struggle because what you're doing is you're creating a you that I need you to in the next life. So the higher self has got this, this multifaceted perspective of the self. And, uh, and, and you might be doing something that's very helpful to it that you aren't aware of. And your pain and hardship is a part of, the, of, of that picture. And, uh, and again, the, the whole thing is bringing God back in. And if you get that God self inside you, that embodied higher self, yes, of course, I believe that you could be saying, you know what, I've had my time here, I want to move on. But you might find that your higher self is the one saying, no, 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 I love it here. I love these challenges that I go through, actually. They help grow me. And uh, it's, it's, it's a different role. The brain is one role and the consciousness is the other. And and humans can be making choices about one thing, but your consciousness is really saying something else. So, yeah, it's up to the self, though. Many near-death experiencers are told on the other side that they're not finished yet. They have to, or they need to, or they should come back. Right. Do you think those gray aliens are the ones that are advising them? No, I wouldn't. I I think 100%. Um, so I, the picture, as far as I'm aware, is so much more complex than we are willing to understand. So here's an example of what I'm thinking about. So I'm talking about the higher self. Well, the confusing part is you could have multiple offshoots. The higher self could be having multiple offshoots in physical reality uh, at the same time. And you might have, uh, like, like your higher self could be offshooting, not just yourself, but people in your sphere that have been influencing you all your life. So your mother could be part of your higher self. Or your or your friend your best friend growing up that influenced you could be your higher self. So you're all you're like a the best analogy I use here is a plant is a tree actually. Uh, so you have the leaf which is you, but then you have a stem, and it doesn't go to the trunk yet, which would be the big G, the big God, the unified field. But you have branches going all the way up, and the branches are collective collectives, right? They they bring it uh, closer together and closer together, and so you could be an offshoot having three you know uh, three physical manifestations. And you're all together working together. And so I believe when someone's passing on and they're they're someone that comes to them and tells them and they're they're in a form, I believe it could be, you know, someone who's, who's dearly connected to them. And, you know, could be their higher self. So it's the uncle who, you know, influenced them all their life, could be the dad. 
Um, or, you know, someone, it could also, you know, we create from the consciousness directly. So even though the person isn't your higher self, all you, you enumerate about is your grandma uh, in the afterlife. And then when you have that near death experience, your grandma is there because she knows that you're the one connecting with her. So then she's there for you in that kind of loving way. And I think, I think all those things play a part in the experiences people have. I noticed that you're calling God the unified field. So are you saying that God is basically this field of all the information of the universe? No space, no time. So what happens if you're connected to no space, no time? You have access to everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about focus. So we're all individuations that are focused, uh, have directions and focus. And you have, you literally can access anything if you know how to put your focus there. Um, it's the comprehension aspect of the, of the consciousness that limits that and and frequency when we know how to change vibrations we can you know peer into certain realms um but yeah the big g is the unified is the unified absolute yeah definitely besides managing us what else are the grays doing in the afterlife i don't know if i can answer that for ourselves but i do know that they build other worlds and i am certain that's part of the big picture here so I do know, um, I'm told that, I'm told, why are they, I get to ask actually at one point, uh, my 21st contact event, uh, why do they, you know, why do they take semen? Why do they, why did they take the biology of humans? Why were they doing that? Why did they do that to me? Because that's part of the thing. They did that to me. And I get explained uh, to seed other star systems. And then they, and I, I push, but why? Why are you doing this? Because uh, because the universe desires to be born. So if they're playing that role here and they're taking, you know, human seeds, which could be considered maybe denser than gray, maybe, maybe gray aliens, you know, bodies are not as dense. So maybe they're able to be in the afterlife as a corporal form, but maybe the human is denser. And so the idea that possibly they're, they're creating these systems, uh, in other planets, um, I think is a very big possibility. Uh, I can't speak for what else they are doing or how much they influence. I actually am convinced they don't try to influence. I'm actually convinced they uh, they influence when there's agreed permission to, uh, because I think they affect the karma of the higher self. So I'm convinced that they really do seek permissions and they try not to interfere with uh, what's happening down on, on the physical realm of the planet Earth. Uh, and only now in the 60s, since the 60s going moving forward, we're needing to be influenced by them because of the changes that are occurring. But I'm pretty convinced that they actually try to, uh, it's a management role, and they try to remove themselves from uh, from interfering with uh, with consciousness. But yeah, I don't have the big answers to that question, unfortunately. I noticed earlier when you were referring to one of the gray aliens, you referred to her as a she. Right. How did you know she was a, of a female gender? Yeah. Um, so I, oddly enough, my contact events are very varied and I do get to see uh, her outside of a jumpsuit. So, and she has no genitalia um, or any indications of sex, but she is oozing this, um, I guess, emanations or emanations of, of vibrations coming off of her. She's an elder. I call her the elder in my, in, in my book. And uh, it's a motherly female presence. Um, but uh, like, like um, someone who uh, kind of runs a portion of her society, there was a feeling of, of uh a matriarch basically is kind of the feeling is, and she, that would, I guess it came out through communication in general, cause I did communicate with her quite a bit. Uh, so eventually I do kind of have this motherly matriarch leader, elder feeling uh, emanating from her. And so I call her the elder. Uh, she, I, I know that the, the aliens themselves are, are asexual. I'm pretty convinced of that, but I think we're going to find um, as we learn more and more about this kind of spiritual aspect of the entities that archetypes actually remain in the spirit realm so you can have females or male spirits if you will um and i think that that's part of partly at play here there's an archetype within her consciousness as she's manifesting as that elder and she's she's a she's a female energy is what she is definitely did they reveal to you that we are some sort of hybrid or that they created us 
yeah, so I, I get that in the third contact event. I don't get explained too much detail about it. Um, they actually tell me two different things. They tell me first that they they did make us. Oh, actually, I get explained in three different contact events. There are different scenario, different contexts that they get brought up. Um, but she is explaining that she they make the human body for the soul. So they they did this for the souls. They, they're kind of telling me that. In the second contact event, I get explained that they made the human brain. And then they needed to make an adjustment, which is why there's the hybrids coming. And then the third is very fascinating, um, that they had put gray alien hybrids on the planet a long, long, long time ago. And the only, I don't get years or dates, I get impressions. So it was in the impression of the hundreds of thousands, 100,000 years ago, 120, 130,000 years ago type of thing. And, uh, and that they're gray alien hybrids. And then those genetics are in the population. So they're not so they're not isolated anywhere. They're intermixed with things, and uh, it seems um, it's a very interesting aspect uh, that um, because it seems uh, the contactees that I talk to um, all have Irish roots. We it doesn't we don't specific, specifically have to have direct Irish descendants, but it's in the genetics somewhere, and uh, it just seems like possibly that's a connecting piece here, though I don't have too much other information about it. So they created us as a homo sapien, but now they're kind of working on us and mixing us with their DNA and creating a homo sapien gray hybrid. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting about that, it just feels right to say this in this moment, I'm not clear that other alien races aren't doing this either. And that it's kind of a hodgepodge of things going on, but I'm definitely explained that that uh, they are the hybrids are coming, and uh, yeah, and they are they're merging. They want to merge societies. They want to merge societies. They want to merge the race, uh, the species. Um, it's nothing against the human. It's it's much more uh, that uh, a change needs to occur, and it's largely to do with the planet, uh, the planet being under stress. And so they need they need to make a collective uh, need to put it so the collective society, you know, helps with the reorientation of the new direction. And uh, yeah, so hybrids are coming in. And then the plan is over generations. It all merges into one over time. I've had two guests tell me that there are underground caves with alien human hybrids there mm. and that they're waiting to release those hybrids on the Earth. Oh, interesting. Did you hear or did you learn about that? Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I, it's fascinating to hear that. Uh, mine was a floating warehouse. Uh, so, you know, I, I've scoured UFO BC database. We have a couple databases here in, in BC. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get people witnessing crafts that are the size of a city. Like, what is going on here? How can you even have that? That doesn't even make sense to the human. So unless they're phasing these these massive, massive objects that occasionally people see. Um, and so one of the things that I experienced, my 10th contact event is in northern Saskatchewan. It's a very empty rural area. And I got taken into a floating warehouse. So and yeah, it's stacked with hybrids. Uh, so uh, and that was the premise is there were the, they call it the, they, for me at that moment, she called this twin. It wasn't a she, it was kind of a he, she. And it was basically a, uh, yeah, these are the new humans is what she, uh, they were called basically. Um, and that was the impression is that they were waiting to release them. Yeah, they were in preparation. Yeah. Did they look any different from humans? Now, these were like stereotypical of what you would expect of a hybrid. So they had black eyes actually. And they were, they were lifeless. They were fully grown that's even kind of creepier. So uh, fully grown bodies kind of waiting to, they were slumping in the tubes and stuff. So there were all these tubes and they were all stacked up. And then it, went, it was a stacked up and then it was a huge line of them going down far into this warehouse. And they were all slumping and leaning over. And they looked like tall, uh, tall humans that had black eyes and they were bald. Yeah, so I've heard all, so I don't know sometimes if they're telling me these things for symbolism that these are what we're doing, or these are some version of that hybrid species. I don't really know. I've heard people say that there's hybrids now that are very blended, but we, they could do that from the get-go because I know I have alien, gray alien genetics, so I'm some kind of a version of a hybrid of theirs. So I think there's 
you know, definitely gray alien hybrids walking amongst us that don't even know they're hybrids. And uh, so it's hard to know where the variation goes. But I, the ones I saw had the bigger eyes and they were in the side facing and they were bald and, uh, and they were fully grown. You mentioned other alien races. And did they ever show you any other races out there like Pleiadians or Syrians? Yeah, um, <clears throat> they were working with several human species. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't have too much knowledge about it, actually. The main, the real main point to be looking at is this mantis species. So I experienced this entity. I call it the leader in my book. It's because I don't, I don't think we even know what that thing is yet. Um, I think it's manifesting as a mantis, but it seems to be manifesting as different animals for different humans. And mine was a kind of an aardvark, though characteristic, characteristically, every time it has the, uh, you know, the uh, the arching hands like a mantis would. But mine was like a standing aardvark and it kind of had a snout and it was the leader of the program. And he's a bit intimidating, but still kind of loving, but definitely kind of fatherly figure. And I interact with that entity uh, three times, I believe. And uh, yeah, it's a slightly intimidating. So, but he was the leader of the program, kind of managing the entire thing. And I eventually learned that. And then there will be definitely other humans that, that I'll interact with. Um, I don't get a lot of information from them. At one point, they're telling me uh, there is a federation of planets. And they show me a, a they, this entity comes up and it's a big human. And they say, I'm a Palladian. And then that that mantis type entity comes in and it's basically explaining itself as much as it can. It re, it kind of resists providing a lot of information. And then the greys are there as well, too. And uh, that's the gist of it. Like a, there's a couple of the contact events where I'm not really learning about the human, but there's a humanoid alien. And they're definitely aliens um, because they don't they have slight features. Like in one case, it was just pure white eyes it was one of them. Um, I also go to I also go to a city. And uh, I inter and it's a humanoid, uh, but not a human that I'm interacting with. Um, that's yeah, it's really interesting. And in, in the in the contact events I have, there's this crossing over of gray aliens, and then there's also these humanoid species. Like they all kind of work together. Is really the vibe I got from those contact events. How many contact events did you have? Um, <clears throat> so I've uh, the whole scale, everything that unraveled. From 16 to uh, 39 years old, uh, so that's 1993 to 2017, is 26 contact events. I also have these five childhood contact events. I've now un unraveled all that and kind of understood what was going on there. So altogether, it's 31, but I really stick to the 26 because that's the story. That's the real gist of what happened to me. At this point in your life, now that you've remembered and processed all this information, how has it affected your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. <clears throat> You know, 26 contact events is a lot, and they gave me a lot. And you can't just go live a normal life anymore. And the reality is I interacted with their tech, and their tech is consciousness tech. So I was affected by it, and I have impressions of it still. They also have uh, what's considered like a... Um, uh, downloads, and they gave me those, and those are still in me. So I've written everything, I've put it into books, I've talked about it in presentations, and it's still all sitting in me. And I really, and there's things I'm still learning about. Um, the alien genetics thing, they, I'm now really zeroing in on some of these things. Um, they really were amplifying genetics, uh, like my, my, the feeling of, of my, my body. So the, the feeling of the genetics, they're amplifying it on the crafts. And I kind of realize that now. And, uh, and then I'm trying to zero in on what they were doing and I'm doing it in meditations. So I just, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the exploratory mode as I tear apart what happened to me and, and, uh, and very grateful that I got the book out and that I'm, I'm supported so I can be talking about it publicly. Uh, it's, uh, it's still just processing and what's even, you know, really wilder is the aliens, they gave me so much and there's still so much mystery. There's still so much to still be learning. And it feels like that's why we humans didn't get disclosure. We don't have disclosure because, you know, we're like you and me are talking about the afterlife and gray aliens, but I can't, I can only imagine 
let's count 100,000 who maybe you're okay with a conversation like that. Uh, the rest of the 8 billion people on the planet might be really struggling with those ideas. And that's just that, right? You still have the, the inter interacted with, the, with us in their history. Uh, you have maybe their plans, what they're doing. So there's this big, big picture. And they seem to have given you a lot of different pieces, knowing part of the instruction was to write a book and tell people about it. Uh, so they wanted me to do that. And, uh, and so they gave me a lot that can mull over and I'm still learning. So I got my eyes glued on the kind of disclosure process and what people are saying. And, uh, and so I'm really, uh, I focus on that. I focus on what happened to me personally, privately in meditations. And I still do my own ex exploratory work. And I actually have another book coming out. I have a rising workbook coming out. Uh, and on top of it, I just keep eyes with uh, the disclosure process uh, as I really kind of move forward with this. Because you have to. I became not an aliens and UFO guy to an aliens and UFO guy. There was just no other way to do it. So, I feel like disclosure is up to them. And if they want to, they can just do things and fly around so we can all see them without yeah. questioning it. Yeah. Did they give you any sort of timeline when that may happen? No, but uh, <clears throat> planetary destruction is the main issue. And uh, that was definitely crystal, crystal clearly emphasized. And <clears throat> I don't know what it's like in the States, but we are experiencing un unprecedented uh, changes up here in Canada. And uh, things people didn't even expect when it comes to with weather or just the effects of environmental damage. And uh, it feels like it's at the cusp of it. And so this idea that um, I now zeroed in on John Ramirez talking 2027. He has a really strong podcast or a moment in a podcast where he's saying, well, yeah, definitely 2027 is the moment we all learn about it all. And it was actually a 10 year disclosure process. And that makes a lot of sense to me. That was actually the first thing I gravitated towards because the aliens having a timeline makes a lot of sense because if they're, if they're touchy about the planet, it's definitely moving towards the direction with which they are very concerned about. So um, no, but I'm convinced between your and my lifetime, we are definitely going to see it all unfold. So are you saying that these earth changes are imminent and unstoppable and that's why they need the hybrids? Uh, yeah, it's, it's so... <clears throat> The planet changes are the result of us kind of expanding, you know, and really the, the problem here is, is capitalism. It's, it's the paradigm we've all grown up in. We've all grown up in a, in a mind frame, a paradigm. We all, we're all stuck in this idea. It doesn't even matter that I had alien contact or someone saw the near death experience. Everyone's trying to figure out how to make money from it because that's the life we live in, right? We live in this, with the capitalistic life. So someone wants to write a book, they were, it's, it's, we're stuck in it. We can't get out of it. And information flows through capitalistic structures. And it's the only way around some of these details. Um, and so these are paradigms that we're stuck in. And the idea being is that the hybrids are going to be a little bit more uh, unity focused and consciousness focused as a, as a collective species. And that will be curbing us, trying to bring us kind of back to source, if you will, to the, maybe the big G, the unified field, um, but also consciousness tech. And um, I do know, I, I've said this many times over, the freedoms we experience in uh, their world are greater than the freedoms we experience in our world. And I think that's the big point of it all. Um, but we can't do that when we're in this capitalistic structure, when we're, you know, when we've got Steve Jobs, the one making all the money from the consciousness tech, uh, that doesn't really fare well with what needs to actually happen. So it's something along those lines. Do they have a message for you to reveal to earth? Yeah, I'll say it to you. It's, uh, this is what the elder said to me in a, in a telepathic communication. So in a, the elder and the leader, actually, I, I was in communication with both of them and it bears the back of the book. And they said, it's not to dominate you. It's to change to societal structures that benefit you and to change to societal structures that benefit nature. There are ways that are very advanced for a society to coexist, but they are reorientations of your sense of self because they involve consciousness technology. What is the title of your book and where can people find out more about it? Yeah. 
title of my book is The Rising, uh, The Alien Plan to Build an Enlightened City on Earth. And you can find it at www.jeffselver.com, J-E-F-F-S-E-L-V-E-R.com. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about the city that they're planning on building on Earth? Yeah, it's, um, it's after a planet event. So something is going to happen planet-wise, uh, a shift, a shakeup, something. And, uh, and then they put the city down after that. And uh, I don't really have too many other details, except it wasn't really, you know, the information wasn't given to me in a very human way. I think humans, we, we would want to see blueprints, maybe or even a future timeline of events happening, all kind of laid out crystal clear, and they don't do anything like that. It's all very symbolic. And she basically, it's in the instruction of telling me to write a book. She says, tell them we're coming, basically, is the idea. Tell them we're coming, and there will be a new city. And I had some experience with the hybrids. And then she shows me the hybrids I had worked with or I had experiences with were now in the city. And, you know, the it's important to mention that I didn't really experience aliens in this city. These hybrids weren't really aliens. They were humans who had like an adjustment or something new to them. And they weren't dressed like aliens. They were wearing pants and T-shirts. So I think they were trying to emphasize like, hey, they're just they're just new humans. They're not trying to be scary. And uh I think the best way to think about this is nature, actually. This is about um, think of aliens as nature and not as the terrifying things we've all grown up with as strange creatures. Uh, but these are aspects of nature. And the city is a consciousness city with their consciousness tech. So uh, with dimensional aspects that uh, of no space and no time that could expand the human into something very glorious, I think, is the idea. So are you saying that the hybrids are basically new bodies that we're going to start incarnating into? Yeah, something like that. I think that's the idea. An upgrade. An upgrade. Yeah, a genetic upgrade to help with the planet as a whole, as a collective. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder if they will help install some new system that is completely different of what's going on now new system in what way? once we start reincarnating into these hybrids do you think that they're going to also manage what's going down here on earth like redo our system of governance like we won't be in a capitalistic type society anymore yeah there's so um there is some things i do know about their tech and the impact way it'll impact us uh number one is um so you'll have access to all information so there can't be any corruption you would just see the corruption. <laughs> so you, you could access that information. So it's a, uh, it's a very different change of, of, of freedom. And, uh, and so you also don't have capitalism because you don't need to, uh, everybody, cap what capitalism is doing is feeding the spirit drive. The soul is desiring to experience its purest freedom within every human being. And because we don't know how to experience that, we seek it on the outside. And all the capitalistic structures support that. And all of that will be gone. So as I mentioned, I went to a white room, things like that will be available to the human. So you will experience your spirit and you will realize you actually don't need anything. Uh, you, don't need, you don't need any attachment to anything. Uh, you will actually be able to experience your spirit as it is. And then just being the human on the planet is the joy. Uh, not the things you can do with your wealth. So I think those will change naturally. Those structures won't be th something that they'll need to in place or create bureaucracy about. All of that gets eroded because we are now living from a, a pure sense of self. I also know that um, they will be changing the frequency of the planet. This stuff is just, you know, this is bonkers for people. Right? And, uh, and I do know that that's something that's going to happen here. And in that... The human will have uh, uh, more access to the higher self. It'll be easier to access our, our our pure spirit. And so, yeah, I don't know what kind of management actually will happen as far as if there is any management. And again, they might be just acting with nature and letting nature take its course and not using infrastructures or bureaucracies. And that's what I expect. Also, they work with an AI. They work with the, the kind of quantum God AI that they have. And... Um, I think that helps govern everything. I think it helps with the larger collective management and uh, and it gives you all the freedoms that you're looking for. So it's a really different world. It would almost be considered utopia, 
for humans. And uh, the challenge is, is that we need to raise our, our consciousness in the process. And that's not easy for humans, right? We all grew up with pain and suffering. And, uh, and so we have embedded ideas about that pain and suffering, and that's sometimes hard to erode out. So I think it's a lot, it's, it sounds utopia, but I think it's the challenge of, of what every yogi goes through with it comes to enlightenment uh, is the struggle of the mind. And I think those things will be the, the, the real only barriers in this new world. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open yeah. to that? Of course. Yeah, definitely. What's the best way to reach you? Um, my contact is at my website, yeah, www.jeffselver.com. All right. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, the bottom line, the entire picture is that you are God. And uh, it sounds, you know, uh, give it five years. I'm certain this is where disclosure goes is uh, we are all God manifesting into our physical bodies uh, to figure out that we are God. Self-realization is a part of the picture. And uh, and I'm certain that's the way to empower ourselves in this new world and a way to empower ourselves uh, uh, as it's coming. So. Jeff, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Yeah, Jeff, you got it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.